Three Waters has now had its final reading, so it only needs the Governor General's assent. It has. Uh, so, um, what what uh, people would say is that this is not democracy. The government hasn't taken the people along with it. When you consider, eighty eight thousand submissions were made, and fewer than three hundred were heard by the select committee. Is that democracy? Well, I think that you know, if you went out to New Zealanders and said. Uh, should we stand by in a situation where we've been presented with information that says some people will face increases in bills that could be well, as we've high... we've heard that argument, but it is, is, is this democracy when the uh, minority of people, uh, under 20%, supported the Three Waters legislation, oh, I, and yet it's going through. I don't, I don't agree with your summation of that. Uh, well, we've never, poll that was taken. We never, we never take, for instance, solely select committee submissions as being a singular indication of, uh, of support. Thank you, Michelle Hippolyte, and now kia ora tato katoa, and welcome to the first of the 2010 Treaty Debate Series and Soundings Theatre to Papa Wellington. The series is organised by Te Papa in association with Victoria University's New Zealand Centre for Public Law. My name is Claudia Orange, Director of Collections and Research at Te Papa, and I'm chairing this session with Dean Knight, Associate Director of the New Zealand Centre for Public Law. Uh, Dean is not only a senior... The subject for this year's series is Evolution and Not Revolution. And I might explain that I selected this title when reflecting recently on how New Zealand has changed over the 35 years since the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal in 1975. And unlike many other countries, we have taken an evolutionary path in race relations and not a revolutionary one. And yet in the last 40 years, we've witnessed what I'd call revolutionary changes for our country and in our relationships between Māori and the state. Well, today, Professor Paul Spoonley is the first speaker, and the title of his presentation is Making New Zealand. His topic covers the years of activity in Māori and related matters that has led our country into an evolutionary pattern of change rather than the revolutionary one. Well, there have been key players in those years of change, and one is certainly Orangi Nui Walker, who is here with us and who will uh, comment later on Paul's lecture. But first, I have much pleasure in introducing Professor Spoonley. Paul holds a personal chair in sociology at Massey University, Auckland. <laughs> nā mihi, nā mihi kia koutou. Katika kia mihi atu kia ranganui, to iwi fokatu here, e rangatira tenakoi, te nakotu katoa. I want to identify and discuss the events and the people that have contributed to what I believe can be justifiably referred to as a paradigm shift that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s in New Zealand. An imperial and colonial frame of reference was replaced by one that recognised to a much greater degree the Treaty of Waitangi and the rights of Tangata Whenua in the context of a liberal democratic state. How we now currently operate in our public spaces and renegotiated sense of what it means to be a New Zealander is dramatically different from that that had occurred previously. The shift has required that our key institutions, Parliament, the justice and education systems, for instance, operate in ways that are now very different and often radically so and without precedent to guide those responsible. It thrust new people and new organisations into leadership roles, and one of those who played a key role, Ranganui Walker, is with us tonight, and I'll return to his contribution shortly. The events of the mid-20th century set the scene for what was to follow. With some notable exceptions, the state had pursued what I would define as ethnocide, of seeking to achieve the cultural assimilation, the total cultural assimilation, of Māori until the 1970s and the 1980s. But if cultural assimilation was the goal, the reality was that Māori were marginalised economically and largely confined to very poor rural areas in New Zealand. Marginalisation, social justice usage, the process in which groups of people are excluded by the wider society 
Marginalization is often used in an economic or political sense to refer to the rendering of an individual, an ethnic group or national group or a nation state powerless by a more powerful individual. In general, marginalizing refers to the process of relegating, downgrading or excluding people from the benefits of society. New Discourses Commentary there's nothing wrong with the above definitions for marginalization taken from social justice glossaries as they are written. What's wrong with them and the understanding of the concept within social justice are the theoretical assumptions about how, when, where and why marginalization occurs, which all necessarily proceed from theory. Even when theory is presumptive, paranoid, delusional, or flatly wrong about what is going on, theory generally presumes marginalization is either far more influential or far more unjust or both than it is in reality. In particular, theory assumes that marginalization is systemic and ultimately rooted in matters of identity such as race, sex, gender, sexuality and so on. That is, social justice theory assumes that society is socially constructed in such a way that members of dominant groups like white, male, masculine, straight and so on have built the system so that it excludes and oppresses members of marginalized groups, people of color, women, femininity, homosexuals, and so on. Their knowledge is, and their ways of knowing. These social constructions are deemed to be real, permanent, and unjust, and in need of disruption, which can only be adequately achieved through a social revolution that remakes the system in a new way without oppression. Members of marginalized groups are considered in need of protection under social justice theory, usually through programs such as diversity, equity, inclusion and justice. Members of putatively marginalized groups who do not claim to experience or suffer from their alleged oppression are dismissed as inauthentic and likely to be suffering from some internalized racism, sexism, or normativity. See also false consciousness, consciousness, raising critical consciousness, internalized racism, internalized oppression, internalized sexism, internalized ableism, and internalized misogyny or acting cynically in pursuit of some kind of reward from the dominant power in society. See also acting white, patriarchal reward, male approval, and neoliberal reward. This has the effect of ensuring that the marginalized can only speak from and into theory, turning them into tokenistic props for an abstract endeavor that may not represent them, their feelings, or their interests. See also hegemony. From the floor. I'll make this short and sweet. I'm Josh Clark, uh, kia ora. My question's more to, um, to Dr. Paul Spoonley. Um, you talked a little bit about how um, multicultural can probably support biculturalism. I'm just interested to hear what kind of strategies, as New Zealand does become more, as you know, more um, yeah, multicultural. Kia ora, Josh. Um, uh, I think Ranganui has a, a view on this. Can I just give mine and allow Ranganui the right to, to add his? Um, immigration has provided New Zealand with a very different set of demographic and political dynamics. It, I mean, as I mentioned in the speech, this country has transformed itself through immigration in a way that very few other countries have post-2000. What I think is very disappointing is that the treaty has not been part of the policy discussions, but also that Māori have not been given the role of welcoming those new immigrants here. I think the immigration relationship, if you like, has left Māori out, and that is a position which is unsustainable and something needs to be done about it. 
Uh, the preamble to the treaty is New Zealand's first immigration policy that uh, the chiefs signing that treaty had agreed to the fact that there were British people coming here to New Zealand, the Queen's people, and they needed to be cared for. But in our own time, immigration has become a tool of economic development, and this is what I personally am opposed to. Uh, my strategy is pull up the drawbridge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Asmina and Paul, please. Um, the, the question of treaty-based, um, tr treaties being part of the framework for immigration, absolutely. And uh, as I'm sure here is that the, the disconnect between our colonial history with Indigenous and Aboriginal peoples and our immigration policies has been absolutely um, kept apart in, in, in various ways. And so um, there is a move began last year by the Productivity Commission to see that treat the treaty, uh, New Zealand Treaty, Tatility, should be at the very core of all immigration policy. And what you could do is you could take some of the non-state indigenous values. Manakitang is the idea of helping people and you bed them into immigration policy. So the question is really one of delivery of how that actually occurs, uh, particularly when you understand that indigenous and, and migrant communities often lift, live in different worlds, both in a territorial but in a discursive sense as well. Um, I, did, I did the biography of our most uh, noted Maori radical academic, a guy called Ranganui Walker, and Ranganui said that um, our immigration policies were too liberal. And he saw three things happening, a new demography, a demography when those communities um, uh, outnumbered Māori, uh, that their languages were heard more often than te reo Māori, Māori language, and that they were much more competitive in an education and job market. So there are some tensions, and, and how, do we, how do we address those tensions? Social justice is particularly concerned with the marginalisation of people from minoritised groups in their capacity as knowers and of their knowledges. This is a particularly fruitful vein of theoretical research in both social justice epistemology and critical pedagogy, the theory of education. The central claim is that one of the primary ways in which dominant groups maintain their dominance is by marginalising other groups as knowers and discounting their ways of knowing, which might include traditions, superstitions, myths and other cultural beliefs or practices. A wide variety of concepts seeks to explore this problematic, including epistemic injustice, epistemic oppression, epistemic violence, epistemic death, active ignorance, pernicious ignorance, willful ignorance, white ignorance, orientalism, hermeneutical injustice and testimonial injustice. The issue with these concepts, speaking broadly, is that there is a meaningful difference between science, reason, empiricism, and those methodologies and other ways of knowing, which is that they work and are known to work. Therefore, the preferencing of them over other ways of knowing and knowledges produced by other ways of knowing isn't unjust marginalization, it's just marginalization. This is the central confusion of social justice theory, which is culturally relativist at its core and thus lacks the tools to discern that some epistemological methods are generally superior to others and their power as knowledge-making tools is neither arbitrary nor unfairly privileged nor a mere cultural artefact of white Western men as social justice theory has a habit of insisting. <laughs>